You've got questions. Well, we've got answers. We have the man to answer those questions. Jeffrey Levine from Buckingham. Jeffrey, welcome back to another episode of Ask the Hammer. Good to be with you, Bob. Good to be with you. We're in the middle of what some people sometimes describe not only as open enrollment period for Medicare, but FAFSA season. And um, and the question that I got goes like this. I've read that the new FAFSA application changes the formula for financial aid and that saving more in my 401k could boost my financial aid. How so? Well, the first thing we need to discuss is that the final new FAFSA, as we sit here today, Bob, you and I having our chat, is not yet available. Normally, that's out in October of a given year. However, because there are so many significant changes to the form as a result of pandemic-related legislation, uh, you know, this is, comes from changes back in 2020, the changes that are happening now. There is still a, a question as to how this form will look in its finalized version. So based on what we know, though, there are some important changes. Now, it's worth noting that for most people, the changes are likely going to make it uh, easier to pay for school, right? Most people will actually have a, a lower, what we used to call expected family contribution or EFC. There's a new term for that. It's called the student aid index, but they're effectively the same thing. Well, going forward, most families will have a lower uh, expected amount, if you will. However, that being said, the families that are most likely to be negatively impacted are those, let's say, with more than one child in school at the same time. That's sort of a big group of people who might see their expected costs go up because that expected amount that you pay, let's say it's $10,000. If you had two children in school under the old rules, it would be split 10,000 across two, so $5,000 per student. Going forward, it's still gonna be $10,000 per student. So that's sort of some of the big changes there. And so my first comment is, don't necessarily assume that this change is going to be detrimental to you. It might be impactful and helpful. Now, beyond that, when we talk about savings in a 401k versus saving somewhere else, it all comes down to, you know, what are the benefits and drawbacks? What are the relative strengths and weaknesses of a particular strategy? And there are all sorts of things to consider. For instance, a 529 plan, which is often looked at as the educational savings account, it has the benefit of having tax deferred growth while the money is in the account. And when the money is pulled out of the account, if it's used for qualified higher education purposes, that money is tax free. So super efficient on the income tax side of things. But if you have a 529 plan, that money can be counted against you as an asset. If it's your account as the student, if it's your parents' account, that can count against you from an asset perspective. By contrast, if we look at a 401k or something like that, retirement accounts are actually excluded from being counted on the FAFSA form. They don't count at all. So that's a good thing. It's eliminated from an asset perspective. However, if you use that money during years when you're filing the FAFSA to pay for the student's education, well, you're going to have to add it as income. Plus, even if you don't use it, let's say you wait long enough, it might not impact you on the FAFSA form. But when you take the money out later, if it's in a regular 401k, you're going to have an income tax liability associated with it. So the question becomes, for a lot of people, that income tax bite might be worse than any sort of additional expenses that they might have by having a 529 plan in the first place. So is it the right thing? Look, for some people, the answer is yes. But if we were looking at a broad, um, a broad cross section of people, is it the right one for the majority of them? No, certainly 529 plan makes more sense for more people. I think probably even a Roth IRA might make more sense for a lot of people than let's say a 401k plan would. Yeah. As you were talking, I'm thinking of that proverbial sort of uh, saying about pulling a thread uh, from a sweater and having the whole thing unravel. So what Indeed. started out as an easy question in my mind became a it depends question. Yeah, you know, it's worth pointing out there are some other factors here to consider. So this question specifically talked about 401ks didn't say IRAs. So with a 401k, one of the questions is, can you even get your own money, right? Like if you're still working and you're not 59 and a half, what access do you have to that money? It may be nothing at all. So you may be stuck in a situation where you've, 
your savings saying, I'll use this money. And then the plan says, well, sorry, you actually can't touch this money at this point. And even if you could, if you take money from the plan and you're younger than 59 and a half, then there's generally a 10% penalty. Now, there is an education expense exception for the 10% penalty, but it only applies to IRAs. It doesn't apply to employer plans like a 401k. So take, let's say, a $30,000 distribution from your 401k today to pay for your child's uh, tuition for the spring. That's going to have a $3,000 10% penalty associated with it if you're under 59 and a half. But if you were to take the same $30,000 today and move it to an IRA, and then tomorrow took the same $30,000 distribution from the IRA, no more $3,000 penalty. Now, sounds like a, a little bit of tax sleight of hand, and indeed it is, but that's the rules we live by. That's the rules we have to play by. Yeah. So speaking of tax sleight of hand, is it worth even mentioning the education credits that might be available as you think about paying for college and what your student aid uh, index might be? Sure. I mean, look, to your point, right? Once you start pulling that thread, everything unravels. You can't look at things in isolation. So maybe to your point, right? Yes, taking out money from your 401k might increase your income. But if you're using it to pay for education expenses, maybe that provides a credit. Now, of course, there are income limits as to who can qualify for those credits. The credits are only for a limited amount of dollars. But yes, you have to look and see what is the net impact. Really, what we're looking at is what is the net tax impact of using one type of account versus another? Then we also may want to look at what are the investment options uh, available. For instance, you can use uh, EE bonds, right, to save for college or higher education uh, expenses. And to a large degree, if they are used for things like tuition, let's say, you can have tax-free interest, but it's just quote-unquote interest. Right. So is that going to be accumulating enough? So it's about what are your investment options? What is the tax treatment of those options or whatever account it's housed in? Are there any penalties and so forth? And then also, what, if any, impact will the asset or the income that you draw from that asset have on your potential financial aid? And you got to put that all together and then make the decision. Looking at just one item on its own does not tell the full story and oftentimes can result in an incorrect decision. Yeah. Jeffrey, as expected, um, you've given aid not only to this reader, but I think lots of others. So thank you. Well, we would love additional questions. In fact, I, you know, we talked about the FAFSA form here. I want to introduce a new term for everyone. That's the GOOC. That's the G-U-Y-Q, which is give us your questions. Send them to us now. We want to hear from you. Let us know. College aid, retirement, whatever have you. Send us your questions. You can do so to askthehammer at buckinghamgroup.com. Again, that's askthehammer at buckinghamgroup.com. And Bob and I look forward to tackling your questions here real soon.